University, particle physicist by training, and more precisely, neutrino physics, current area upward. She is now currently in JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University. And if you see, you know, particle physics and in addition, quantum correlations. So uh, one very uh, nice thing is that things like, you know, um, legate gorg inequality, very phase, quantum correlation, how they manifest in neutrino physics and particle physics in general has been one area of research where she's deeply interested in. So that's quite fascinating, you know, quite fascinating because neutrinos don't interact very strongly, they move around long distances. Maybe some of these things may be able to play fundamental role at a more fundamental level. So today, uh, you know, uh, since we talked about three phases of the geometric phase, Poonam, you can uh, start speaking. Yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, am I audible? Is my screen uh, shared properly? Yes, you are okay. audible also. Okay. All right. So, uh, thank you very much, Professor Panigrahi, for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, talk about geometric phases and uh, and its uh, applicability in wide variety of contexts, including high ener from high energy physics to optics to condensed matter systems. Uh, this is something which uh, I have been interested in uh, for almost like uh, 10, 10 years or so. And I will I will talk about this journey uh, with you today. Uh, before I start, I would also like to uh, uh, mention that it's a uh, it's a very remarkable effort, effort on the part of Professor Panigay to hold this uh, almost a month long uh, school and then uh, a few additional days even, uh, uh, which is basically focused on quantum information and quantum technologies. Uh, which is uh, an upcoming, which will be the future of science. So there is a lot of effort that's uh, uh, that's uh, coming from the government side. There are a lot of funding opportunities in this area. And uh, training uh, young students is uh, also one of the important goals, which I think uh, through this school, through this workshop, uh, is being uh, achieved in a very nice manner. And uh, I think it also allows students to have uh, exposure to all areas that are related or within this uh, realm of quantum information and quantum technologies uh, in its full depth and uh, breadth. Okay, so with this, uh, I, let me uh, begin my talk. Uh, I am going to talk about three, so the title is three phases of the geometric phase. And uh, by three phases, I will qualify what I mean uh, by these three phases. Uh, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, so naturally when we talk about geometric phases, uh, the phases that come to our mind are uh, that of uh, Professor Berry, who also spoke at this uh, school. And uh, another phase that comes to our mind is that of Pancharatna, who also did work in the context of uh, optics in early years. And, uh, and it turns out that there is a, there is an interrelation between the work in the, uh, the work of Berry and, and that of Pancharatnam. And uh, of course, Professor Berry, I think, mentioned about it in his uh, colloquium, but I am going to delve a little bit deeper on it uh, today. Okay. And another interesting anecdote is that of uh, uh, if you look at the title, there is something you will find uh, from Mayan civilization uh, Three Faces of God. Basically, this picture I found very amusing. It, ha it has these three uh, kind of faces, which is the center one is that of birth, then adulthood, and then the last one is death. So it basically covers the cycle of life. You start, you get born, you are uh, in your young age, and then, then uh, uh, no one dies. So this I found a bit amusing, so I just put it up here. Uh, okay, and I also understand that uh, today's session is dedicated in in the memory of uh, Professor Hema Ramachandran, uh, who, uh, who has played a pivotal role in, in the national mission of quantum technology and application. And uh, she uh, succumbed to cancer, and unfortunately, in around uh, in November 2020. Uh, and uh, although, I mean, it was very untimely and completely unexpected, not many people knew about her struggle. Uh, 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 because she was very passionate even till her uh, last minutes. In fact, as per uh, what our DST secretary, Professor Ashutosh Sharma says, 
she was a gem of uh, exceptional brilliance, uh, not only because of her scientific contributions, but in her rather extraordinary commitment to a national mission uh, without any self-interest, even while going through uh, her uh, intense pains and hospital stays in the last few months until her passing away. So uh, this is what describes her, I think, very beautifully. And uh, uh, fortunately, I had the uh, uh, opportunity to interact with her uh, during my stay at RRI. And our, I mean, we did actually uh, one work together, which I will be covering in this uh, today's talk. So, uh, uh, so uh, what I mean by three avatars or three phases of the geometric phase uh, are basically I'll try to cover um, the con uh, the context in neutrinos, in the photons, and in the electronic counterparts. And uh, this is. Uh, uh, so basically, they, they appear everywhere, and when, you, when we are talking about the world, we should talk about it in a unified sense. So uh, the physics of geometric phase has far-fetched implications in all variety of science, as we can think of. Okay, so my, my talk will be basically based on um, the following works. One is in the context of neutrino physics, then optics. We uh, gave a theoretical proposal with Sam and Sukuna. And then with Hema's group, uh, Nandan and Deepak, we performed that experiment. I'll cover this in very great detail. And then finally, uh, all of these ideas have, uh, have, uh, uh, have existence in the, in the condensed matter context. And, uh, and and we will come to it if I can manage to cover everything. I'll come to it, but this part will be more brief uh, um, compared to the first two parts. Okay. Uh, also, I, I would like to mention here that uh, I think in Professor Berry's talk, there was a mention, there was a discussion on pi and holonomy, and I will cover it uh, uh, in, in this um, uh, today's talk. Okay. Uh, so here is my plan of the talk. Uh, I'll first go over the introduction to geometric phases and uh, what are the different uh, versions of the geometric phases and what context do they appear. And then we'll come to the, the my three phases in, as in my title, uh, the high energy context, optics, and the condensed matter context. Okay, so let's begin with... Uh, uh, description on uh, what are geometric phases. We have heard already some, some bit on it, but let me just for the completeness sake. Uh, so uh, geometric phases are important because they gave, give us a unified description of a variety of systems. And this is what I'm going to exemplify through my talk today. Uh, also, it's an interesting phenomena in quantum mechanics. It occurs in many physical systems. It has been tested in various branches of physics optics, molecular spectroscopy, nuclear magnetic resonance, microwave cavities, and so on and so forth. So uh, there is a very nice uh, collection of all the works on geometric phases by Shapiro and Lucet, and uh, uh, that's like a very good collection of all the important works in this area. Uh, the greatest value perhaps lies in providing a completely new viewpoint to look at the quantum theory. Even if geometric uh, ideas do not lead to something which is completely uh, new or, or which is like a revolution in our understanding of physics. I think as Anandan says, I think uh, uh, the greatest value is that it allows us to appreciate that, that same physics with a different viewpoint. And that's also equally important and interesting and intriguing. So uh, 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 now uh, it turns out that importance of uh, interferometry is uh, I mean, it is very much intertwined. We cannot, so the idea of phases was were very nicely described by uh, Professor Berry. So if you want to look at phases, whether dynamical or geometric, of course, you have to have something, uh, some, some experiment which involves interference. And um, so uh, the, the role of interferometry, double slit experiment, the role of coherent sources, et cetera, cannot be undermined. That's very important. And then, of course, the geometric phase, the idea, uh, per se, uh, 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 actually came about by the, the seminal work of Michael Berry uh, in 1984. And, and soon after that uh, work was um, noticed, 
uh, it was, uh, I think, uh, Professor Ramashesha and Professor Nityananda from RRI who brought about, who actually uh, 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 related the uh, or, or uh, brought to the forefront the work of Pancharatnam and, and also conveyed this to Berry. And soon afterwards, in 1987, I think Berry wrote a very nice paper on, on describing Pancharatnam's because Pancharatnam's work was on the in the context of uh, it, it talked about polarized light interference of that but translating it to a quantum mechanical language was very beautifully done in another paper by Berry in 1987 I will come to it and uh, so it turned out that this work was an early precursor and optical analog of the phase that was discovered by Berry of course the conditions of the occurrence of the geometric phase uh, 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 were, were uh, laid down to be adiabaticity, Hamiltonian, which depends on parameters and so on and so forth. But it turns out that there is, this leads to a, gen this has a generalized notion of the idea of geometric phases, which also uh, um, uh, embodies the, the uh, ideas uh, described by Berry. So, uh, so, so far so good. Uh, so what was what was the idea of the Berry Berry phase? The Berry phase. Uh, the main idea here was that you have a time varying Hamiltonian. So Hamiltonian is uh, dependent on some parameters and typically multi-dimensional parameters which depend on time. So Hamiltonian depends on time through some parameters. Okay, and then the condition was that the parameters are such that they they vary very slowly. Slow means slow compared to uh, slow. The idea is that the state should cling to. So start with that. If you start with an eigenstate, uh, the state does not jump to any other level. So it, it changes, but it does not do level crossing. So uh, the state basically clings to an eigenstate. That's what the slow variation ensures. And then cyclic evolution. If you uh, after a time period t, the parameters come back to themselves. Um, and then the question that was asked was, what is the phase that the state picks after a cyclic evolution? This was the idea. Uh, and in this, uh, the naive guess, which is uh, what comes from only incorporating the dynamical component of the phase, uh, which is E dt, uh, integral of uh, E dt, that turns out to be wrong. And so that's the, the amazing thing that he found was that this naive guess does not work out to be correct and if you if you find out correct expression it turns out that there is a another component which is a purely geometric component which is given by this so this is the this is the uh, uh, Berry connection it is also written like uh, this and it's like a dot dr is like a uh, integral over a closed loop this is also uh, like the aronov bohm phase in the parameter space so here, what is essential for uh, for uh, uh, obtaining a non-trivial uh, outcome for the uh, geometric component, which does not, which is uh, which is very robust and which does not wash away, it, the essential uh, elements were uh, the Hamiltonian that's time varying, and and we required an eigenstate which clings to itself because of the adiabaticity condition. And when this is satisfied, one found that um, the, the uh, geometric component is given by this. Okay, so far so good. Uh, and one can also make a connection of Berry space with the idea of quantum parallel transport. In fact, if you look at the, if you remove the dynamical phase from the state and uh, do the Schrodinger equation, automatically has the parallel transport rule for the neighboring states and which is referred to as imaginary part of phi, phi dot in a product is zero. So this is the natural connection. It is already embodying in it uh, this natural connection. And uh, this is uh, this tells us that as we go around a closed loop, uh, phi returns with the changed phase, which is a quantum geometric phase. So finally, your uh, uh, phase has two components, one completely dyna dynamical, which is like integral of E dt, type of term and, uh, and another term which is purely geometric which depends on the path traversed, how uh, much path has, that has been traversed. Yes, is there some?
sorry is there uh, is there a question hello no it's probably my mistake just go okay. ahead okay okay all right so uh, uh so you get this what is what are the essential requirements to obtain a, a berry phase under the um, under the scenario where you have a hamiltonian which depends on parameters which depend on time and uh, so what are the essential requirements to observe an additional piece in the evolution the requirements are multi dimensional parameter space because you want to explore the curvature of the um, i'll come to it of the hilbert space and adiabatic and cyclic evolution of non degenerate eigen states so uh, eigen states are non degenerate that's one thing one is talking about eigen states cyclic evolution cyclic and adiabatic evolution and hamiltonian the role of hamiltonian is very very crucial now why uh, uh, why uh, why more than one parameter because if you have only one parameter and you come back to itself you will never enclose any solid angle which means that you will never have a uh, geometric component so at least two or more uh, uh, time dependent parameters are required also one can notice that i mean this quantum parallel transport is something very nice because uh, very easy to understand if we think about so if we have a flat space uh, and we take a vector and no matter how we take it around you know, it doesn't matter you will ne never have uh, anything non trivial but if you think about a two level system which is the simplest system one can think of uh, the the space of states or the ray space is a curved space it's like a two dimensional uh, sphere it is sometimes left referred to as a block sphere or the poincare sphere and because the fact that this is a curved space no matter what we do we take a vector no matter how we uh, move it around on the on the surface of the sphere we are definitely going to uh, have non trivial effects and that's the uh, that's the uh, key reason why why one one sees something non trivial now whether that is an observable quantity whether they, that is um, something very robust or not that that those are questions one can ask but uh, under certain conditions yes one can actually define that quantify that quantity and one can one has seen it also in a wide variety of contexts so this is the story of the berry phase now uh, uh let me go to uh, the idea of panchratnam phase so panchratnam's work was in 1956 and as i mentioned berry wrote a very nice paper um, describing panchratnam's phase in in quantum mechanical language so the question that is so Uh, my discussion follows this paper mostly uh, so what the I, what is the question that was asked the what was the question that was asked is if you have non orthogonal states okay what is a natural way to compare the phases of those two non orthogonal states so naturally uh, uh, a notion of geometric parallelism can be drawn from the inner product so if we have two states let's say a and b we can define a quantity uh, called the inner product of these two states and uh, a reference condition was laid down which is like the we can refer to as the panchratnam's rule uh, if this inner product is real and positive the states are said to be in phase or parallel the notion of parallelism was laid down like this and what are the implications of this rule now if you have such a condition it turns out that if i if i uh, so if there are these two states if i add them either they add constructively or destructively it turns out that if this condition is satisfied the norm is maximum the norm of this resultant vector turns out to be maximum and physically this corresponds to uh, interference of the superposed beams giving the maximum intensity or probability so uh, Uh, it corresponds to maximum probability and the norm of the resultant vector is maximum uh, if this condition is satisfied now given that this is what is i mean there is a physical interpretation also of this rule fine now but this con this connection or this rule is reflexive and symmetric which is which means if i uh, uh, if a and b are uh, in parallel uh, parallel to each other then b and a are also parallel to each other and so if i interchange them they are fine but, and also within with each phase but this is not a transitive rule so that is basically the essence of 
observing something that's the Pancharatnam phase. If I take three states or three rays, what is a ray? Ray is nothing but state uh, 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 with the phase freedom. So e to the i alpha times two state. So that's the, because you want to put all such states which are connected by this uh, transformation, they are referred to as a ray. Uh, so of, if you have three rays, pairwise any two of them are in phase. So A is in phase with B, B is in phase with C, and C is in, uh, but it turns out that if pairwise even they are in phase, it turns out that the, the C is not in phase with A. So this is due to the non-transitivity of the rule. So uh, what is this uh, uh, phase of this complex number, A to B to C to back to A? It turns out that this phase is related to, uh, if, we, if we have these three rays, A, B, and C, they are like points on the blocks or on the Poincare sphere. And whatever is the solid angle that's subtended by uh, going from A to B to C back to A is something that gives you the uh, uh, geometric component of the total phase. So what is Pancharatnam's, uh, what was, what is the idea here? Have, we have not talked about any Hamiltonian here. You see, here we are only talking about quantum collapse. You start with A, go to B, B to C, and back to A. And this quantity, uh, uh, so we are talking about collapse and cyclic quantum measurements. No role of Hamiltonian here. Uh, even when, uh, so it's, it's basically due to the geometry of the Hilbert space. Because the space is curved, when you when you do this uh, cyclic um, cyclic quantum measurements, you naturally end up getting something which is non-trivial. So, and this is related to half the solid angle that this geodesic triangle um, subtends at the center of the sphere, uh, center of this sphere. So, Pancharatnam's phase reflects the curvature of the projective Hilbert space and is independent of any parameterization or slow variation. And also, one should note that here there's no need to have any eigenstate. It can be any state. Also, uh, uh, one really even can have a situation where Hamiltonian is in fact constant in time. So uh, the, the Hilbert space for a two-level system is a, is a block sphere. On this block sphere, we see that there is a, because of the non-trivial cur non cur uh, curvature, we end up getting something uh, a solid angle. Uh, if we talk about uh, 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 a series of quantum measurements, so this leads to geometric phase. That's one way. The other way is the uh, uh, Berry's work, where you have a Hamiltonian, which is dependent on slowly varying parameters, time-dependent parameters. And, and you're talking about eigenstates there. Um, there also one can get it. Uh, ultimately, everything is related to this because you, if you have a two-level system, you put, put your states on a block sphere. And the, the uh, essence is that there are many ways of realizing this um, non-trivial solid angle. And uh, these, do, these prescriptions give you uh, different views of how you can do so. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, to summarize Pancharatnam's phase, you can have Schrodinger evolution possibly interrupted by measurements that can lead to, uh, so minimum requirement here is three states and no, no need for non, uh, no need for eigenstates. You need minimum three states for non-transitivity and exploring the curvature of the ray space uh, and cyclic projection of the states. This is what is the essential requirement. If you take any state and subject it to multiple quantum collapses and bring it back to itself, then the resulting state is given by this and the phase of the complex number is nothing but what is related to the solid angle that's subtended by uh, doing this series of collapses. Okay. Uh, uh, now, there is yet another uh, possibility. I, I mentioned here that the state, uh, it can also appear, geometric phase can appear when Hamiltonian is constant in time. So let's, uh, that's the, uh, the easiest example one can think of is take, an, take a Hamiltonian like this. Uh, this is also, uh, uh, in a sense, to appreciate the work of Aronov and Anandan, who said that you just needs, needs, need, uh, need cyclic uh, evolution and no need, no need for eigen, so it's like non-eigenstate dynamics and you have a static Hamiltonian here. So this is yet another way. 
here also, if you start with any general state, and if you do the correct computation of the dynamical phase, you will see that exact solution it has a mismatch with the dynamical phase, and the missing piece is exactly the geometric phase, which is given by uh, 2 pi 1 minus cos theta. Cos theta, theta is the angle that this vector makes with the relevant axis. So uh, whatever is the solid angle subtended by this gives you the geometric component. It appears irrespective of presence of any variable parameters in the Hamilton. So this is uh, this is the summary of the discussion of the geometric phase. Uh, if we have a two-level system, we can have uh, realizations of geometric phase in in a variety of ways. You can have you can bring in your Hamiltonian to do that job. You can uh, explore the curvature through the just the states because your uh, Hilbert space for a two-level system is curved. Or you can have a static Hamiltonian and uh, uh, start with any general state, and one realizes that there is a non-trivial uh, missing piece, which is uh, geometric and which can be related to uh, the trajectory on the uh, uh, point sphere. Okay, so uh, uh, is there any question? Maybe I can pause for a minute. I don't see anything in the chat box. I okay, okay, then I'll proceed. I thought maybe if anybody has a question. Okay, so uh, having described uh, the idea of geometric phases, uh, let's first now look at the context of neutrino oscillations. And uh, neutrinos are uh, interesting because, uh, of course, as Professor Panigre in the introduction itself mentioned to you, that they interact very, very weakly. And, and they interact very weakly, yet they uh, they uh, they are one of the most abundant particles in the universe. After photons, you have the neutrinos, which are uh, which are one of the most important, most abundant uh, uh, particles in the universe. So, what is interesting about them? So, the interesting aspect about neutrinos is that they uh, they oscillate; they change from one type to another. That's what the term oscillation refers to. Why do they oscillate? That's the natural question that comes to our mind. So neutrinos are produced and detected via weak interaction. There is something called weak interaction, and weak interaction governs all the processes that are connected to neutrinos, which are who are neutral uh, leptons. So because they are produced and detected via weak interactions, the states that are produced are different from the stationary states of the Hamiltonian. And in fact, they are linear superpositions of those stationary states. So one refers to the weak interaction eigenstates as the flavor states, and the stationary states of the Hamiltonian as mass states. And this mismatch, so naturally, if you have a, any non-eigenstate, you will expect that it will change, right, under evolution. So this leads to oscillation, which is very, very similar to the idea of birefringence in optics, which depends on the properties of the medium. Uh, oscillations takes place even in vacuum. So unlike optics context where you require non-trivial medium for non-trivial effects, here uh, neutrino oscillations take place uh, even in vacuum context. These are driven by non-zero mass splittings and non-zero mixing angles. In matter, oscillations are still driven by mass splittings and mixing angles, but they get modified due to some effects which are uh, called coherent forward scattering uh, interactions of electron type neutrino with the electron, which, which uh, does some changes to the, uh, but essence is that this uh, mass splittings and mixing angles are, are the key to uh, observing effects uh, uh, due to neutrino oscillation. That is why one says that the uh, observation of neutrino oscillation gives an indirect evidence that neutrinos are massive particles. Okay, and in general, uh, here, one does not need to worry about incoherent scattering cross-sections because they are almost negligible, and one sees sustained coherence uh, even over astrophysical length scales. So these these are important things about neutrinos, uh, and 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 uh, and related to why why do they oscillate, and what are what are the what is the essence in that? That's the, like that introduction. Okay. So now I want to connect the effects in optics and the neutrino system. So. In general, one can de describe the effect of medium in terms of a effective Hamiltonian, which has so two by two Hamiltonian. We can uh, expand in terms of Pauli matrices and identity. This is just that. 
uh, the, the components of identity and sigma x, sigma y, sigma z are actually related to what generates the non-trivial optical, uh, non-trivial effects. Hmm? So uh, uh, D is not so relevant. One is mostly interested in A, B, and C coefficients. In optical context, uh, you have optical activity, wave plate, pro quartz plate, and absorptive effects, etc. Uh, of course, here when when we talk about optical activity, wave plate, and quartz plates, uh, quartz plate, it's basically nothing but whichever coefficient is non-zero. So if C is non-zero. Uh, while A and B are zero, basically it's like uh, about the sigma z component being non-zero, that's referred to as circular birefringence. If A is non-zero, that's linear birefringence. And if this is also non-zero, B is non-zero, or all of them are non-zero, uh, it leads to something called elliptic birefringence. And that's, they have, there are different terms that are used for these effects. Likewise, in neutrino oscillations, when you have vacuum oscillation, you have uh, the counterpart can be found out exactly in terms of the mixing angle and the mass square splittings, which are contained in this factor. Uh, notice that the coefficient of the sigma y is zero in, in two flavor context. If you have normal matter, again, C gets modified. I said that C gets modified, again, B is zero. And absorption is very much, of course, this Hamiltonian is Hermitian. So if, if we want to talk about uh, absorptive effects, you, you need to in, uh, incorporate some non-emission effects and so on and so forth, but uh, I'm not going to talk about that. So for the context of neutrinos, we can understand all the effects as we understand the effects in optics just by doing this uh, mapping. Okay, uh, uh, in, the, in the ultra relativistic limit, the dispersion relation uh, for the neutrinos is just uh, given by expanding this factor. You have m squared by 2p. And under some approximations, one can uh, uh, say that the two flavor neutrino context is like a two level quantum system, which means the Hilbert space can be mapped onto a block sphere or a, or a Poincare sphere, which is the term that's used in optics. In vacuum, the mass square difference and the mixing between two flavors uh, leads to flavor oscillation. This I have already stated. In presence of matter, what changes is that, so there are, uh, so here, uh, here we have some term proportional to identity. We don't worry about that. Uh, and we have these terms, theta and omega. Omega is uh, omega is delta m squared by 2p. So this depends on the mass masses of the neutrinos and theta is the mixing angle. And Vc is the additional term that comes in presence of matter uh, due to uh, additional interactions, which can coherently add up and, and lead to a substantial contribution when there is a... Uh, passage through matter. And this was the uh, most dramatic matter effect is the MSW resonance, which was pointed out by Mikhaev, Smirnov, and Wolfenstein. Uh, interestingly, uh, because the flavor changing neutral currents are not present in the standard model interactions, if your vacuum mixing, this theta and omega are zero or delta m square is zero, there will be no mixing and oscillation. Matter really will not matter because you need off-diagonal terms to see the effect of oscillation. So this is just an aside. And one can uh, use the Poincare sphere to visualize the effects of oscillation. You can have a generalized state written like this. Hamiltonian, I said that there is no sigma y term. We see that this is sigma x and sigma z term and sigma x term, no sigma y term. So you are basically, even if we are talking about the Poincare sphere, we are restricted to a great circle. You are on the xz plane. Hamiltonian is real. And of course, on this uh, block sphere, your orthogonal states are like antipodal points. Uh, you can think about uh, these as right circularly, left circularly polarized states, or any general state as an elliptically polarized state. And oscillation can be just visualized as if you have, this is your flavor axis and this is your mass axis. Oscillation is nothing but precession of one of the axes about the other. And most dramatic matter effect, MSW effect, is like when the theta becomes here and you can get complete swapping, mu alpha becomes completely mu, mu beta, irrespective of what your vacuum mixing angle is. So that's, uh, that's the essence of. So there is a very nice isomorphic connection uh, of polarized states in optics uh, with the neutrino states. Of course, all of this also goes through um, uh, when we talk about uh, 
phenina magnetism, spin up and down. Those are also two states. And this is also related to uh, the thing of the uh, school uh, because we talk about qubits, right? So that all this goes through as long as we talk about the two-level quantum system. So uh, uh, two flavor oscillations. Uh, the idea of oscillation was uh, coined by Ponte Carvo. Uh, flavor states are, like I said, what are produced by weak interaction. And mass states are what are the stationary states, uh, the eigenstates of your Hamiltonian. They are related by this mixing matrix. In two by two case, it is just an orthogonal rotation matrix. Each mass state propagates as, as something and oscillation arises due to this phase difference between the different uh, mass states. And probability takes a simple form. It's like sine squared two theta, sine squared this. And the, this factor is the height of the curve. This factor tells you when the oscillations have developed or not developed. And, and because this depends on delta m square, you, um, uh, oscillations are a, are a signal that uh, neutrinos are massive, although it's an indirect hint. Uh, okay, uh, how do we visualize oscillations? I already mentioned there is this mass axis and flavor axis. You have precession about these axes. So here I have defined what are the mass states and uh, this is the flavor axis. And one can have equivalent descriptions in terms of density matrices. This is like the Louisville equation or the spin precession equation. Uh, so one has to identify the appropriate um, uh, magnetic field uh, components. Here they are dependent on the mixing angle theta, and uh, but one is uh, uh, one is basically restrict when we are describing all of this. One is basically restricting to a great circle, so that's that's the idea. Okay, so now uh, uh, when we want to detect geometric phases, uh, the key ingredient is a split beam experiment. But because neutrinos interact very very weakly, uh, the, the um, uh, because if we want to access the idea of phases, uh, we, we need to uh, look at the interference terms. No, but the, in, in case of neutrinos, they interact weakly. So you cannot have uh, design a split beam experiment in physical space. However, the effect of oscillation is essentially a split beam experiment, but in energy space. This is what one can think of. You have a flavor state split into two states whether evolve adiabatically or not, and then we combine them uh, into another flavor state and then mod square and then get the um, uh, probability. And, and whatever we see in the probability is uh, yeah, will contain effects of the phases through the cross terms. So here again, that is what is described. Uh, what turns out that if we write down the probability correctly, then we will see that there are these, uh, these uh, sorry, these terms that appear as a cross term. If we remove the dynamical phase, then these are connected to the two path interferometer in the energy space. And this can be visualized as a closed loop quantum collapses with intermediate adiabatic evolutions. And that's basically a great circle in the XZ plane. And one can show that this, this term is containing the effect of the uh, uh, geometric phase if you enclose it, no matter what your dynamics are, is basically whether whether the one is propagating in matter or in vacuum. If we enclose uh, this, uh, if we if we enclose the origin, then you get a phase of pi. If you do not enclose the origin, the if the, your terms are such that you do not end up enclosing the origin, then the phase is uh, zero, which is basically in accord with unitarity. You see, these are the cross terms, and it turns out that. Um, uh, there is this minus sign in the mixing matrix, which has a uh, interpretation of being a uh, uh, geometric or let me say topological component, uh, which uh, which is basically inbuilt into the description of the phenomena of neutrino oscillation. So, so there were claims that there is no geometric component in the physics of neutrino oscillations for two flavor uh, scenario. That's not right. Uh, it just turns out that the minus sign in the mixing matrix already encodes uh, encodes the effect uh, of the uh, geometric effects. And it turns out that because you are, again, restricted to a great circle, you are uh, getting a non uh, uh, a factor either pi or 0. Pi is uh, uh, e to the i pi is what gives us a minus sign. 
Okay, so this is the summary of this. The minus sign, the appearance of the quantized phase of pi was demonstrated. Uh, then uh, one can also think about this is, so uh, the summary of the story is that if as long as we have a real Hamiltonian, this is, uh, 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 as long as you're, uh, you're restricted to a great circle on the Poincare sphere, your uh, phase can only take values which are, uh, uh, if you enclose once, you get minus one. If you enclose n times, you get minus one to the n. And whether you or not you enclose the point or the origin, uh, you will you will pick up a phase or not. And uh, in the neutrino context, these are the sigma x and the sigma z components, and you uh, end up uh, uh, picking up a phase. This was not so unexpected if we had examined the form, uh, if we had uh, this intuition. Uh, of what longer Higgins had obtained. So plus or minus one phase should definitely arise and, and the global structure is very similar to the Mobius band, which uh, leads you to the state get coming back to itself, not after two pi, but after four pi. Okay, uh, so now- try to wind yes. up, eh? yeah. Oh, I see, okay. Because the other speaker is from Moscow, he had given- I see, I see, I see. Okay, okay. So I'll just uh, skip some slides here. Uh, next, next case is that of uh, 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 optics context. Uh, in the optics context, what we uh, uh, worry about is usually when you talk about interference effects, we are interested in amplitude interference, uh, and and we are we are interested in coherent sources. But surprisingly, the uh, in the uh, context of the in the idea of intensity interferometry invokes. Um, perfectly incoherent source. And it, the surprise was that if you have a perfectly incoherent, uh, perfectly thermal source or incoherent source, then one gets a clean measure of, uh, uh, clean measure of uh, cross correlations, which do not have any background. So here the idea was very simple. Here what we did was uh, the HPT idea was that you have two sources and two detectors. And there is a uh, interference between the uh, uh, between the uh, direct path and the uh, cross paths, and that leads to something non-trivial. Here, uh, when we have uh, uh, so in the same setup, if we if we incorporate the spin degree of freedom of the photon, it turns out that one gets a non-trivial component which is in addition to the dynamical terms which we can classically understand very easily. Uh, random fluctuations in the sources one and two in both the sources illuminate both the detectors and therefore they get completely correlated. And it turns out that it's only ap appearing in the cross correlation term of the, so you need two detectors and a cross correlation only uh, reveals the effects due to this geometric phase. And uh, if we do I3, I3, if we do uh, self correlations, it turns out that uh, there is uh, that, that doesn't uh, make an appearance there. So it is a non-local non effect, completely due to uh, entanglement, and uh, it's uh, it's appearing at the level of higher order correlations. So I think I should skip uh, maybe in the quantum field theory language also this can be uh, uh, described. Basically, the idea here is that the path on the Poincare sphere is being traversed by two photons and not one, a single photon, which covers a non-trivial solid angle. And that's what is uh, uh, leading you to the geometric term. Here, uh, uh, you can understand uh, this by interference between these uh, processes. A photon from here can go either to detector three or to detector four if it, uh, there are these two possibilities and there are these two possibilities for photon going from this source. and. Uh, these two different photons coming from either source make a non-trivial trajectory on the Poincare sphere, which is what reflects the uh, com geometric component in the total cross correlation uh, uh, that signal is seen. Okay, and uh, uh, here we this is the experimental demonstration, uh, experimental setup. Uh, here one had you we had used quarter wave plate linear pole. This is the work with HEMA. Here we had uh, employed all the, uh, in the optics context, the realized realization of the idea using acousto-optic modulators, which induce phase, uh, random phases in the uh, coherent signal from the laser beam. And what was seen was, 
here it goes uh, so this is the cross correlation and this is the angle between the two pol uh, polarization states here it goes from 0.5 to 1.5 uh, uh, very neatly and as tau as the delay increases this vanishes this effect vanishes we also observe that g44 g33 uh, is uh, is uh, is not dependent on this 534 so it's only appearing in the cross correlation very neat signal and this is the summary of uh, this work so can i take one two minutes two minutes more yeah yeah okay, okay, okay. so the summary so okay. far is as follows we talked about the non-local phase, which is not uh, visible in any local experiment at either detector. Uh, so this was a non-local uh, realization of Aaron of Bohm experiment. It can be understood in terms of single particle effects. You need a pair to enclose a uh, solid angle on the Poincare sphere. Uh, geometric phase is given by half the solid angle subtended by a pair of photons in many physical systems. And uh, then we think, we thought about what about uh, solid state physics, can we have analogous uh, implementation of these ideas, uh, non-local effects, inter intensity interference effects in the context of solid state uh, physics. And here, uh, it turns out that the same pi and holonomy that I talked about, if you talk about PN junctions of helicolloid states, so here the, these, uh, so uh, it turns out that in this context, uh, a simple classification, if you talk about the junction conductance, uh, it can be classified according to whether one has an NP, PN, or NN junction. And the spin degree of freedom uh, plays a role here in terms of whether or not you will get a pi phase or not. So this was also something which is uh, very interesting. The pi and holonomy that I saw in the neutrino context appears in a PN junction of the helical edge states. In the electronic HPT-like setup, there were already some ideas by Boutiquer's group, the theoretical ideas, of doing this two particle uh, uh, electronic Hanbury Brown twist setup and the experimental realization of that. But note that these were only exploiting the orbital degree of freedom of the electrons. And spin played a very dormant role. Part of the reason was that the spin manipulation is very, very, very tricky. And uh, what we proposed um, as exactly an analog of what we did in optics context. Uh, was a quantum hall realization of polarization by doing spin manipulation. So initially we, uh, so this was the work of uh, Vishwajit where uh, 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 spin manipulations are possible that was shown in their one of the works. And using that, we, we employed it in the context of quantum hall uh, effect. And then finally quantum spin hall effect. And we saw that one could actually manipulate the spin of the electron uh, completely and cover the entire uh, block sphere by by uh, fine tuning that manipulation. In the in the electronic context, this cross correlation is often referred to as the short noise, but it is one and the same thing exactly. Uh, so here uh, I'll I'll probably skip the details, and if somebody is interested, please do feel free to write to me. Okay, so um, so so this is this was very very uh, beautiful that. Uh, uh, the effects uh, that we saw in optics exactly uh, show up also in the context of uh, uh, electronic uh, interference, uh, electronic context. So um, this is what my summary is. I hope I could convey uh, that geometric phase have, uh, phases have uh, implications uh, uh, spread across disciplines. And this is one example which I, uh, some examples that I showed uh, today. And I would like to make these acknowledgments, which is very, very crucial. I think the subject of geometric phases, uh, uh, I, I, I would like to thank uh, Sam, Joseph Samuel, and Sukuna Sina for actually introducing me to the subject and educating me on this uh, very beautiful subject. And uh, uh, Hema, Deepak, and Nandan for uh, uh, the optics uh, realization of, uh, of the ideas that we uh, obtained. And uh, in the electronic context, uh, I would like to thank Saurin, uh, Vishwajit, Krishanu, and uh, Disha. So maybe with this, I can uh, stop. Uh, and if somebody is interested, I'm sorry, I had to rush through the later part of the talk. Uh, uh, if somebody is interested, please do feel free to write to me. I'll be happy to interact. If there are answers, there will be a lot more questions. Are there any?
couple of important questions uh, somebody can read, read it out to the chat box. Uh, no, sir, there are no questions in the chat box. Okay, so then we'll get back to you. You know, talk was very exciting. Okay. And uh, I am pretty sure because this area is so nice and broad, so yeah. people will definitely get back to you. Okay. So we thank you. I mean, you know, because of the time constraint, we are a bit no, no, uh, sure. cutting you off. Yeah. Thanks again. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me check if Professor Bayamonte is around. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Nice yeah. to see you again. So uh, nice to see you. We, if you remember, we met in Vienna. I remember absolutely. It's a pleasure to see you here to welcome you to this forum. So I will. I will not take any more time. I'll directly start with a brief introduction of Professor Bimonte. Now, you know, we said, you know, it's a truly pleasure to have him here in this forum because, you know, suddenly I remember that, you know, when we are talking about industry academia collaboration, and his name directly came to my mind that he's the person who really is always, you know, straddling these two worlds. You know, after his, uh, you know, initial study, he was one of the early programmers in DUF systems and then shifted to, to his PhD from Oxford and then again to Harvard. Then this collaboration in Singapore where he was a postdoc. Then he went to you know Italy and then now he is director of uh, this uh, head of a school tech laboratory for quantum information processing. And you know I mean quite amazing thing is if you see his uh, publications, you know he sort of tackles the real world problems in the sense of is something a computer quantum computer or not. What kind of problem you can handle? Anti complex problems. So you have significant contributions, and uh, today you'll be sharing with us some of these works of surviving day. Okay, I'm just Testing now, is everyone able to see the screen? Um, I think everything should be okay. Yeah, we are able to see, yes. Okay, so the subject of today's talk um, is the uh, variational approach to quantum circuits to minimize effective Hamiltonians. And first, let me thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to see, uh, see you again, the uh, uh, very gracious invitation, and let's go through this. So, um, during the talk, I don't know how the questions work, but if you have questions, you can, um, you know, it's fine with me at least if you if you stop and ask them or uh, maybe type them in. And what I'll cover today in this hour-long lecture um, are the uh, brief topical motivation of the ground state computer. Okay, and we'll start off with the basic definitions of qubits and spin Hamiltonians. Um, these are, of course, effective physical theories. And these are, you know, these effective physical theories allow us to work with um, strongly ordered algebraic structures and logic, and these, you know, these quantum gates, etc. And we'll define some notions of Hamiltonian complexity theory and the ground state energy problem. And then we'll discuss the short ANSATS quantum circuits that are now possible to realize. Um, and they are being built currently at places such as IBM, Google, um, et cetera. And we'll discuss how to use short circuits in variational, AKA quantum to classical algorithms. So um, recently, as people are aware, quantum computation has been merged somehow with machine learning. In some sense, the variational model is a machine learning model, but this is now the de facto model which is used kind of across the world and modern research on quantum algorithms is devoted almost entirely to this now. Um, you know, in terms of the prospects of solving anything practical, this is perhaps not even the intention of the research that we're conducting. Nonetheless, this model presents some interesting challenges to study. And it's, uh, if nothing else, it's just a stepping stone towards something better. And we'll talk about how to emulate quantum circuits with spin Hamiltonian ground states. And that will uh, be used to show the mathematical apparatus of a universal model of ground state quantum computation 
that is realized um, as part of variational quantum computation, where it's the ground state of an effective Hamiltonian model. So how do, how do we motivate this subject? Um, it's been around for a long time. You can remember that the, you know, the leaders of mathematical physics for some number of years were trying to solve and have solved what are called exactly solved models. And you can have, you know, Lee, Robinson, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Baxter, all of these people made these fundamental contributions, but some models appear to admit no um, efficient solution. In other words, um, some models, by just, by just changing a, a few parameters inside of a model, you ended up with a solution that really had no relationship to the solution before that was easy. And then people started to think, hey, look, it might be the case that it'll take exponential time to relate one solution to the other, or in other words, exponential time to minimize some of these models. One such model, and this is not proven, of course, fundamentally, but it's, it's empirically uh, observed. And one such model, which we'll talk about soon, is of course the spin glass model um, on some kind of sparse lattice or even a uniform lattice with just a very uh, small range of tunable coupling. And in general, one of the premises of the talk is that Hamiltonians provide penalty functions for quantum computers to minimize. And this minimization turns out to be um, a computational resource, which is the main resource which is now being exploited in variational training quantum circuits. We will see how um, these Hamiltonians can be, can be mimicked through uh, sequences of local measurements. And the effect of Hamiltonians can be realized through repeated measurements, as I mentioned, of local operators. And this is part of the variational model of quantum computation. Some people call this also quantum machine learning, um, machine, you know, quantum circuits is a machine learning model, et cetera. It's all kind of the same stuff. So this is the most basic setting of quantum mechanics, I would say. This is sort of all you need. Um, and we really, you know, we really only will be concerned with, let's say, measuring the, the expected value of observables. Um, we have a standard Hilbert space of qubits. We'll even fix a basis throughout on the next slide. And then everything is just very, very standard. This is the easy setting. Everything is a bounded operator. Everything's finite dimensional. And so this is, this allows us, um, you know, to get to, to get to this point, there's obviously a lot of physics behind that, but it's not the point of today's talk, but to get here, you'd have to um, start off with first principles analysis of your qubits. You'd have to turncate your physical theory. Usually um, you'll create a low energy theory to realize your qubits. Then you have to make some approximations. Uh, this has, of course, been done for the last 30 years of physics, and so we, we just take this for granted in today's talk, and we sort of approach this um, just by looking at the mathematical structures. And there'll be a series of simplistic physical arguments that we'll build on throughout the talk to say, hey, what we're doing is, is valid in a, in a short time span, even without error correction. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm claiming that quantum computers are going to do something phenomenal without error correction. It just means that the mathematical apparatus that we're able to apply is this mathematical apparatus, and this is a valid mathematical apparatus for a short, a short circuit that is, um, that is executed on today's devices. And so the standard definition, we will fix a basis throughout which will um, uh, canonically define our operators with respect to this basis. It's of course orthonormal, and we have the standard, um, you know, the standard definition of the, uh, the poly uh, uh, group algebra here. And we'll have the standard definition of uh, rotation gates. And so what is the concept of ground state quantum computation? So you're given some Hermitian matrix, and typically this will have some type, it'll have some type of sparsity condition, um, or the number of terms will somehow otherwise be bounded. And the goal is we want to find the minimum of this matrix. So it's a normal matrix, so it has a well-behaved left and right eigenvalue, so you can minimize the expected value. And the idea is, well, how can we do this on a quantum computer? How can we program this? How do we approach this? So the computational power of classical ground states, this is sort of where it all began, right? And I would say that one of the early papers, at least 
you know, and I don't know the I don't know the history of it completely. I don't think anybody does, but the history that I'm aware of, you can only you can only know what you're aware of, right? And so, as far as I understand, the first real paper, so the Cook Levin theorem showed that there was a subclass inside of NP hard that were interchangeable, and these were the complete problems, right? Those were all carp reducible from one to the other. That's in 1979, so not very long after Barahona um, came into this and said, look, the spin glass problem on a uniform lattice with couplers that are distributed over zero and plus or minus one, um, this is going to be uh, NP hard. So NP hard is, of course, as difficult as any problem inside of the class NP. A problem is defined as a class which has to be uniformly generated. So instances have to have some type of uh, simplistic pattern to be able to, to generate those such that you can take um, an algorithm and you can create these instances quite easily. So in this case, the instances were some assignments of the couplings for zero and one, and then the size of the problem was just some grid. And so it's a quite easy to uniformly generate those. And then a problem class is inside NP. This is the important part. If candidate solutions can be verified in polynomial time, okay, that's the important part right here. Solutions can be verified in polynomial time. So the canonical example for physicists is, of course, the spin glass model. The spin glass model is one way to define the energy of a graph. How do we how do we calculate that energy? Well, if we assign um, zeros or ones or plus or minus one to the edges of a graph, that assignment maps to a real number under this Hamiltonian, and that is called the uh, energy of a spin configuration with respect to that graph. Of course, you can calculate this in polynomial time because in the size of the graph, because you can put all of these assignments on your graph and you can, you can easily calculate that energy, okay? So that is the, that is the critical feature of these problems. They're, they're easy to check, right? And we're gonna come back to that a little bit later. And so um, this, these are kind of the ingredients and the, the time period to sort of formulate these ingredients was actually quite early. And, and this is before Kirkpatrick simulated the kneeling and these other algorithmic developments that took place, I would say, in, you know, throughout the 80s and 90s. And then, of course, up until the early 2000s where you have adiabatic quantum computation. Okay. Now, going a little bit further into this, what are the types of challenges that, that we can solve from, let's say, uh, you know, what, what has to be solved to be able to, to make use of these models? Um, practically speaking, okay, one of the ingredients would be the ability to couple three variables together, okay? So if you have, you know, if you have a quadratic two-body interactions, S1, SI, and SJ, how do you, how do you create S, I, S, J, S, K? Well, the way to do it is, to minimize over a slack bit. And I'm putting this here for two reasons. One, to show that this is, you know, this is fairly interesting. Some people can, you know, there's still many interesting problems in this area. It's called pseudo Boolean optimization. Um, there's still very, very high number of interesting problems mathematically in this area. There's a community of people that actually work on this. And you can look up uh, pseudo Boolean um, functions. But importantly, there's a separate method which appeared out of the work of um, Katev and others where they use a uh, perturbation theory to be able to get these couplings. And in doing so, they were able to remove the strong coupling with the slack bit. So here the slack bit is actually, every time you minimize this, you have to minimize with respect to the slack bit, it becomes strongly coupled. Where what will happen is the, the um, state which will minimize the other couplers will allow that slack bit to somehow decouple. And so it's kind of an interesting thing and we'll get to that in just a second. And so we now have kind of established the basic ingredients, right? We say, look, we can have a graph, we can put an energy function on the graph. It could be an Ising energy function. We, and we say that this is an easy problem to check. Given the assignments of the graph, I can then calculate the energy of that graph relative to the Ising model on that graph. Okay, that makes sense. 
Now, what about the quantum version of this problem? Okay, that's the next piece right here. So the computational power of quantum ground states, how do we set that up? It was done for us, of course, in the key local Hamiltonian problem. And in that problem, and so you notice that this thing is actually, um, it actually is not gapped in the thermodynamic limit, okay? But in a finite system size, it will be gapped. So you have, you have the system where you have a, you have a question and you say, okay, so first of all, you're given a gap system. And, and the question is this, is there an eigenvalue in that system below a certain value or are, are, are all eigenvalues above another, another, right? And so the question then becomes um, a decision problem. And the decision problem turns out to be quantum NP complete for K is equal to, uh, greater than or equal to two. So in other words, a general Hamiltonian made out of sigma matrices acting on a graph, the energy function determining the ground state energy function, the ground state energy of that graph um, is, is QMA hard and you can map this into a decision problem quite easily. So this is actually a really fascinating model. And so to kind of, to kind of understand what the mechanism was that was used behind these proofs Okay, we go back actually to the early 80s again. This is around 1982. Um, Feynman, everybody always talks about Feynman gave this talk saying, okay, there's plenty of room at the bottom. But what he actually did as well is he came up with something that's called the ballistic quantum computer. And so this model right here, you can see that this is some kind of, you know, annihilation operator. This is a creation operator. Um, this is annihilation operator. This is a creation operator. And what will happen is this unitary gate will be applied when you have a particle on a ring, when the particle jumps, it applies a unitary, right? It jumps again, it jumps again, then all the way at the end, I'm gonna draw, an eye, draw a little eyeball here, I guess. All the way at the end, okay, you're looking at this and you're constantly making, these, you're, you're constantly making a measurement. So you let, this, you let this thing hop around and finally, when it gets to the very last step in that chain, you knock your electron out or whatever this is, you knock your particle out and the system will stay in a static state proportional to this. And that gives the, that gives the uh, output of this quantum circuit. Okay, and you prepare, so you, you basically have, you know, you have this register up here and then you have this thing that the system's allowed to walk on down here and every single step it takes, it applies another gate as it goes around that circle. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the Feynman model. And what Ketev did was he added a bunch of, he, he transformed this model from, sorry, from Feynman, he transferred the, transformed this model from Feynman into what's called the history state. So all possible walks across that, all possible valid walks, like one step, one and then two steps, one and two and then three, all of those steps are now part of the ground state of this Hamiltonian, a non-degenerate ground state with, with, a, with a gap system. And this history state now stores the mosaic of the quantum computation. And you can add a bunch of identity gates at the end of your circuit and that will boost the output that you're looking for. Okay, so this is the, um, this is kind of one of the most important tools. And if you think about it, it's a good, it's a good challenge, uh, especially for graduate students to think about how would you start off with the with this Hamiltonian number five, and how would you create a new Hamiltonian that had this as its ground state? And then the question is, okay, how you can you can easily do this by making a k-local projector, right? But but can you do this with a five-body Hamiltonian, with a ten-body Hamiltonian, with a two-body Hamiltonian? So these were some of the early questions that people were asking. Now. What type of Hamiltonians can prepare equation seven as their ground state? Well, it turns out that these two Hamiltonians, so I, I proved this uh, with, with Peter Love, who's now at Tufts, and we proved this in actually in 2007, it was published in 2008, and we showed that essentially an inductive coupling plus a flux coupling on a system that was some kind of flux qubits um, could realize a model such as this, or perhaps with a flux to inductor coupling here, 
Uh, we could realize a model such as this, and this type of system had a ground state that was universal for quantum computation. And these are physically realizable, kind of by construction, at least in principle. And the idea was, okay, well, you know, you have this company D-Wave, as we mentioned at the start. So um, can, can D-Wave actually build something that's universal? This was the motivation. And the trouble is this, the trouble is this, in order to do, in order to realize this, we have to be able to realize terms such as X, 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 et cetera. And in order to realize those higher order couplings, you need to introduce an energy scale that is unphysical. So you have to introduce, you know, let's say that your energy scale that you're working in is some kind of range of a few gigahertz. Then suddenly you have something that is a, a thousand times that or a hundred thousand times that. Um, one of the gaps in your Hamiltonian is just huge. And so it was very limiting, right? And I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. So I have a um, next slide now. Here, what we're talking about is we're saying that this same Hamiltonian as on the previous slide can emulate, for example, a YY interaction, which is not present in this term, but it requires a gap that scales as an inverse, inverse fourth order. Okay, so it's a huge gap, a huge energy scale. And here we'll go back and re remember in the first slides where we introduced this extra slack bit, but as I mentioned, it was strongly coupled, okay? Um, here is a method to decouple that slack bit, but it comes at the cost of an epsilon to the fifth. And so um, this perturbation theory stuff, I think for people in uh, quantum computation, this is a, you know, it's a green, it's a kind of a formal perturbation theory based on Green's function. So you can actually do some different bounds. And so these are quite fun um, to read about. There, you know, there's several, several papers around that time that did these sorts of, sorts of things. So where are we? Where are we now? Um, here is a table, and I think it, it conceptually explains what we're, what we're doing. So I got a little friend joining me here. <laughs> so it conceptually explains where, what we're doing and where we are. Now, here's the point of this table. I think this table is very, very important. So the one local Hamiltonian means a one-body Hamiltonian. This is obviously... You can obviously diagonalize this either quantum mechanically or classically in polynomial time. So finding the ground state is different. In complexity theory, we, we tend to talk about calculating the ground state energy given a state. So if you give me a state, I can tell you, sorry, not calculating the ground state energy. Pardon me, calculating the state energy. I don't know if it's a ground state or not. So given a quantum state, can I calculate the ground state of a one local Hamiltonian? Well, in principle, I can say, okay, if I know this is a one local Hamiltonian, I know that there's some product state, so I can give you a product state, you can just calculate this even, you know, even on Mathematica. Now, for something like a two local Ising Hamiltonian, in principle, to determine that ground state, this is NP hard, and we believe that it's exponential. It's not proven, but we believe it. And there's a lot of empirical evidence to say that that is the case. So right now there's a thunderstorm. So this little guy ran up here. It's, not, it's actually my girlfriend's dog. There's a thunderstorm outside. So this little guy ran up here to, I think he's very scared right now. <laughs> this is part of the Zoom uh, culture. We have to kind of work at home now. And so the minimization of the two localizing Hamiltonian is exponential, but in both the quantum and classical case, in both cases, you can check that energy and polynomial time in the size of the Ising model. Now, exponential time for electronic structure, what does that mean? So many people believe that the quantum, the quantum computer is going to be able to solve electronic structure problems in polynomial time, okay? But remember, in the general case, these, are, these represent a class of problems that even subsumes the NP, the NP complete and NP hard two localizing Hamiltonian. So in general, we believe that these will be exp exponential. Now, here's where I believe personally where the big difference will become, will, um, and many people believe this, I'd say, the big difference between quantum and classical computing is in this simple fact. You have something called which I like to call the memory scaling argument. And this is an assertion that there exists quantum states that you can't store in a classical memory. 
most people believe this. It's, it's not proven to be the case, okay? It depends on a lot of things, but this, this argument is really a central argument to quantum computation today, and I think it's illustrated very, very critically by this table by the following fact. We have a situation where I cannot calculate the ground state energy of electronic structure Hamiltonian efficiently if it takes exponential memory to store that state. Where quantum mechanically, I can store that state in polynomial time. So you see the difference here. This is the, this is the critical difference. And we see that these types of Hamiltonians, quite simplistic Hamiltonians, are already um, going to give you these differences here. And so, you know, again, th these things are not proven because this is a, this is a, pro you know, but this is the, the fact that we can't prove it doesn't, you know, um, doesn't discourage people from thinking, hey, you know, there's a lot of things in computer science that are very difficult to prove. So to kind of continue on, um, short quantum circuits to minimize Hamiltonian. So I, if I had, if we had more time, this is a kind of a short lecture, if we had more time, we could start off and do some first principles uh, derivations to show how these qubits are made. Um, qubits are effective physical theory. So you start off with um, a first principle theory of, let's say, a system of low temperature electronic squids, et cetera. And you truncate this system, usually with a low energy, um, low, low energy approximations. And from that, you get your quantum bits out. Okay. And we mentioned this before. And so the model that we're going to talk about, remember, there's big problems with this adiabatic model, which we talked about before, the ground state model, because you have to couple, you have to couple your system together. Uh, you, have to, you have to introduce um, large gaps to couple uh, to create couplings, and these gaps are just simply unphysical and impossible to realize today by any chance. And so we take the view now that we have errors which limit quantum circuit depth. So this makes sense. Now we would like to have we would like to reach the error tolerance threshold where we could do error correction. All right, but we're not there. And so instead, what we do is we say, okay, look, state of the art quantum platforms can reach physical error rates near 10 to the third. And so when, how deep can your circuit get before these errors are relevant? So how, how, you know, how long of a circuit can I realize? Well, I tolerate 5% error, which is okay actually to tolerate 5% error for many problems, for many problems of practical interest um, and theoretical interest. And so NISC era variational quantum algorithms consider a fixed error tolerance. And we create a quantum circuit, which we will tune to minimize an objective function. We tune this circuit with this outer loop classical coprocessor. And so, you know, these, these experimentalists from around the world, I hope this isn't recording, they said, hey, you know, all we need is some money. We'll build, <laughs> we'll build a quantum computer. All the algorithms are understood. And then after they started to build it, this ad hoc model kind of rose out from utilitarian, um, you know, utilitarian purposes. And now everyone's studying this model that we that there's many open questions about. And so it's kind of an exciting time. I would say that the field of quantum algorithms is really being reborn around this model. And so I encourage people that are, you know, to take a look at this because it is interesting. There's a lot of difficult questions. And so circuits now with dozens of gates can be realized with negligible accumulated total error. Even without error correction, we can do something and we can study something, but the computational advantage of this, well, um, it's not something that you know I'm anticipating or actually studying directly, but it's it's something that you can envision that this is at least a stepping stone. And so how does it work? Well, under these simplistic physical assumptions, what will happen is we'll create something, the experimentalist will create something called the ANSATS circuit. Okay, ANSATS is of course a German word. It means uh, candidate solution. So for example, the top picture here, this is a, so a daisy chain would be like this, and then it's called a round robin in English. I don't know where they come up with this. So it's a round robin structure, it just goes in a circle, and this is called one layer, and this whole block will be repeated multiple times. This is good, why? Well, this is good because it lets the experimentalist focus on one specific gate set to realize where typically a quantum, a quantum circuit will come and you have to compile this. No, they just say, look, this is the only circuit we can realize. And the quantum programmer then is allowed to tune these gates. Other circuits, like a, this is called a brick layer or a checkerboard. This is a, a tree. Um, other circuits are possible. This, this is some kind of interplay between what you can do on the hardware, which terms will commute, and, they'll do, and importantly, 
Um, these types of structures, it's easy to calculate their gradients. So you can do steepest descent and other types of optimization methods um, for these circuits. Now, the most famous example of these circuits, of course, is this quantum adversarial advantage experiments done in Google. All right, and so it's an example of it, actually. They use, uh, what, what's, what's happening here is you start off with your qubits down here, you apply some sequence of gates, okay? Now, the, the, there's different ways to do it, and I think that in the future, what we'll see is we'll start to adjust these parameters more, and um, instead of kind of switching the type of gates, it, it depends on which version of the quantum adversarial advantage experiment you're looking at, but the main idea is we tune these gates, and then we look at the classical computer trying to mimic the probability distribution with respect to some cross entropies, et cetera, and eventually the quantum computer wins, and we can't do this classically, and we call that quantum advantage um, or computational supremacy. And so what do we know about these short circuits? So we know more than what I'm about to tell you, but what I'm about to tell you is very easy to prove. And for graduate students working on quantum computation, please pay attention to this because it's actually a very useful tool and it's a fun way of thinking. You'll start to think, oh yeah, I can look at a circuit and I can already tell a little bit about what's actually happening with some very simplistic counting arguments. And so it works exactly like this. Maybe you already know it. Um, the bipartite Schmidt rank is just the num number of non-zero singular values across uh, a reduced, uh, of a reduced density matrix. So I take a quantum state, I can partition this into two halves, and I can look at the, the Schmidt rank, which is just the number of non-negligible singular values of that across that uh, partition. And an EBIT of entanglement is a, it's a way to work without, uh, it's a way to go to some kind of unitless uh, measure of entanglement. So it's, it's actually de defined in terms of the amount of entanglement of one Bell state with respect to any measure. Okay, any entanglement measure, but the, it's independent of a measure for that reason. Um, and the point being that if you have a maximally entangled state in CD cross CD, you'll have log 2D E bits of entanglement. Okay, so it's quite closely related, of course, to uh, rank. Now, the point being this, you can easily create what's called the combinatorial quantum circuit area law. And this is geometrically dependent. So you have an underlying processor where this is the geometry of your quantum computer, and then you build this hardware-efficient ANSATs of whatever type, and you ask yourselves, what is the minimum circuit to maximize bipartite correlations, right? And that gives you this kind of, that gives you this kind of scaling effect, where you can see that different geometries will scale a little bit differently. And the maximum amount of entanglement, okay, before this thing saturates, this is the maximum amount of entanglement that could possibly be generated. So it sounds kind of a little bit funny, but if you think about it, what it's saying is, we don't know if you are generating this much entanglement, but you can't generate more than this under this bound. So for example, if, you know, if, I, have a, if I have a circuit depth, which is much less than the number of qubits, then that will give me some kind of upper bound on the amount of e-bits in the bipartite, bipartite uh, partitions of my system. So this is quite a good, Thing. I will make these slides available to the workshop, uh, to the summer school hosts to uh, distribute and to make available as they see fit. And so people can go through this in a little bit more detail. Now, how do we use these short circuits, right? So let's just kind of recap what we've, what we've looked at so far. We started off with this idea that ground state complexity is kind of interesting for um, people that are studying physics, right? And then we said, okay, well, there's different models that exist of the ground state quantum computer. Now we have this other kind of idea that's not connected yet. We say, look, I can, I can now realize, I can go to the lab and I can realize, not me, but people can go to the lab. I respect these people so much. They can go to the lab and they can actually build a short quantum circuit. And if the circuit, if the circuit is short enough, we can actually realize this and we can only expect a fixed finite amount of errors. Okay, so this is the main... This is the main idea here of what we're doing. Now, 
why are we doing this variational model of quantum computation? I really want to motivate this here as something that's a little bit different and a little bit new. And I think the people that are people that are used to textbook quantum computing, like Nielsen and Chong's book, wonderful book, but nothing in there is going to work on a quantum computer because the circuits are too too long, right? You just can't do it. And so the traditional way, which is like the Nielsen and Chong way, okay, you have an intuitive and familiar textbook quantum algorithms. Uh, these adhere to the circuit model. The theoretical analysis, including complexity, um, has so far, it's, you know, steady progress has been made. There's still open questions, but there's a lot of steady progress, okay? And it's impossible to execute all but the shortest circuits. This is a problem. And it ignores hardware constraints. And it's susceptible to both systematic and random errors. Well, all quantum computing is, but this is particularly uh, a problem here because you don't you, you, you basically are given a very long circuit. And you have to compile it into your system, which is already difficult. Where over here in the variational approach, you're given a fixed circuit. And this has some advantages and some disadvantages. The biggest advantage, I must tell you, is the fact that we can actually do something with it. Okay, you can't do anything with this over here because you simply can't study it uh, in a practical sense because it's just impossible. It's out of reach still. Um, it's somewhat agnostic to systematic errors. Maybe that sentence is a little bit too positive. And it tightly connects hardware with software to overcome hardware constraints. I'd say that that's true. And we optimize short depth circuits for optimal use. Um, we'll get to this in a second. And emulates Hamiltonians by local measurements. So what turned out to be impossible in the gate model and also in the um, ground state model will turn out to be possible, but at a high cost, but possible is the key word, possible. And outer loop optimization can require significant classical computing resources. Yes, this is a huge drawback, of course, and we don't expect something very practical because we really have to push that outer loop optimization so much that the calculation itself probably uh, won't have any practical value in the short term at all. And nonetheless, we can do something. And that's the, that's the key. And the coherence time and error rates this is where we limit we limit our circuit depth, but we've already we're already able to bring a lot more applications into the near term now. Where this other traditional approach, this is still quite far out into the distant future. So we're approaching somewhere around the halfway point, and I guess if there's any questions, I don't know. It seems very sometimes when you're talking on Zoom, it feels like you're just talking to yourself. And then the only person moving on the screen is you. And so it's kind of non-interactive. So if there's any questions, um, I don't know if I, I don't know if I can see if there's any typing. I, I can't actually, for some reason, I can't see the uh, comments section right now. Um, okay, so I, I suppose there's no questions and I'll just continue. So the NISC strategy of variational quantum computation is the following idea. We have a parameterized quantum state or a family of quantum states that we uh, that we can prepare. And the idea is then very simple. We will um, we will prepare this quantum, we'll prepare a candidate quantum state. We will measure these strings of poly operators. It's just some string of poly operators, sigma one, sigma two, prime, sigma three, double prime. And these things are taken from sigma x, y, or z and et cetera. And then we'll compute the cost function on a classical computer. We'll cover this in a little bit more detail, but for now, the important thing is that the expected value of the poly string um, is computed for psi and the classical optimization routine iteratively updates parameters to minimize an arbitrary poly string. So what will happen is, this is actually a little bit, I don't like this, to minimize an arbitrary poly string. No, it's to minimize a sum of poly strings. So it's a convolutional step actually. And so by adjusting the parameters in an otherwise fixed quantum circuit, a low depth noisy quantum circuits are pushed to their ultimate use case. This is kind of the concept behind it. And the point being that we will prepare the state, we will feed it through, we'll measure, this right here will be some kind of effective Hamiltonian which will have many different terms in it. So for example, it could be Jij, sigma i, sigma j. And I would then I would need to take these and I would have to measure these separately. And I will go through, and in the classical step, when I compute the cost function, 
I merge this with the, with the coefficient, j i j, but on the quantum computer, I'm just gonna calculate that expected value. Okay, so that also has the effect of removing um, adverse uh, energy landscape um, distributions that can otherwise be seen in these couplings. And so the variational state space is actually now our search space, okay? And the variational state space of an L-parameterized n-qubit state preparation process is the union of all the possible states that the experimentalist can create. This is quite obvious. Now, the one that we've been familiar with is this product of gates, like the hardware efficient ANSATs, the checkerboard ANSATs. Why don't we use this? This is like optimal control, right? Why don't we use this as a time ordering operator? Why don't we use this? Because it's hard to calculate gradients. So you can get stuck on this to try to minimize, um, et cetera. And it's a little bit more difficult to realize this experimentally because you have more knobs that are tuning at one time. And so that's the variational state space. And what you're looking for is, you're looking for that one state or that family of states that, that can approximately minimize your Hamiltonian. And a variational principle the, the standard classical um, canonical, if you will, variational principle is to minimize equation 15. The true minimum of the Hamiltonian is always less than the minimum with respect to some parameterization of a subspace, okay? Other variational principles can also exist. For example, this will vanish if and only if psi is an eigenstate of, of H. And other, other penalty functions can be derived, but this is the general, this is the general one that's all that's used almost always. And then some other versions of it, some simplistic functions of this Hamiltonian can also be used. And so here is what I think is maybe the most important part to kind of convey is the implementation of H by measurements. So the expected value of a sum is a sum of expected values. So exactly this, I want to calculate this for every state that I prepare. So I prepare a state, now I want to evaluate the cost of that state. So I want to calculate this. Then I can simply expand this. Then I can simply expand it. And on my quantum computer, all I have to do is evaluate this one term at a time. And I can repeat it to get some kind of error tolerance Okay, so it, it does come with a significant overhead, but nonetheless, you can do it. And that, this is the most beautiful part. So I can repeatedly estimate these terms separately. Then I can combine them with these scalars to calculate equation 17. And this reduces the physical requirements so much because if I were to try to mimic this Hamiltonian using, for example, perturbation theory with those gadgets, I introduce gaps that are so large that I just simply can't do it. And if I were, you know, if, if I were to try to realize this Hamiltonian using gates, and I must admit that I've done this with James Whitfield and, uh, and others, where we, we write down a Hamiltonian to mimic electronic structure, this takes thousands and thousands of gates. So it becomes impossible. On the quantum computer, you remove the need for thousands and thousands of gates using this variational approach. You replace them with these simplistic measurements and you remove the need for a diverse range of coupling strands because this comes into the classical convolutional step. And so the advantage again is it comes with a huge overhead, but it, it makes it possible to do something and being able to do something. Well, this is the only, so I always tell people, I say, if you like it or not, this is the only thing we can do. So you, you must accept it at some level. Uh, this is the variational model. And I think it'll be here for some number of years and it, it provides a pathway into um, these other approaches. Now, you would ask yourselves, well, okay, I, you know, many people in the audience, I think most people in quantum computation that come from a physics background, and so people say, okay, well, minimizing a Hamiltonian, everyone knows that's difficult to do, it's important, that gives you the low energy physics of your system, okay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, how do we construct such a Hamiltonian so that its ground state properties are meaningful for our computation that we, that we want to have. How do we do that? Well, we, we use the term that a function, an objective function accepts whenever it evaluates less than some parameter delta. 
And this is, I think, very important here. So we end up with this theorem, which is some kind of stability. It says, look, if you can, if you can guarantee this, okay, so I construct a Hamiltonian. I construct a Hamiltonian that has, you know, has very desirable properties. It's, uh, you know, frustration free. It's, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It has all these, it's gapped in the thermodynamic limit. So I, I, I construct this, we take a finite um, example of it. It's simplistic to make. It's actually, the spectrum is actually isomorphic to the Dickey, uh, Dickey Hamiltonian, which we'll show in a second. And if we can get this to satisfy equation 20, then we assert that equation 21 is then true. And this is really nice because it says, look, I measure this expected value. If I can guarantee this, then I know that that ground state that I'm preparing is actually bounded above and below by the actual ground state. So I think that there's some equations like this, these bounds has existed a lot in uh, quantum chemistry, but I couldn't find this one. If you sit down on a weekend, you can derive this for yourself. And if you see something like that in quantum chemistry, I would like to know, but so far, as far as I know, um, I couldn't find something quite like it in quantum chemistry. I also did some uh, analysis where I would perturb, you know, parts of these equations and then look at how the other side changed. That stuff was sim more similar than this to the stuff I found in quantum chemistry. But uh, nonetheless, if you see something like that, that would be interesting for me to know. But as far as I know, and in any case, this is a, um, although the techniques are not extraordinarily sophisticated to drive this, anyone should be able to do it. The bound actually appears fairly uh, fairly robust and reasonably tight in the scenarios that I've tested at least. And so to construct this model, how would we do it? Well, the simplest way, the simplest way would be to say, okay, why don't I just make a projector onto the quantum circuit? So I'm trying to prepare the output of a quantum circuit. I'm given a quantum circuit. Now I need to take a Hamiltonian where if I minimize it, I get the output of the quantum circuit. So why don't I just take a projector onto that? It's very easy. I can just say, oh, look, I have a, I'm given a quantum circuit, which is described by some series of U's, okay? So U is defined as some product L, U sub L. And so why don't I just minimize identity minus, um, you know, this? Why don't I minimize this? Well, the reason we don't do that is because this is going to have an exponential number of terms in general if I express this in the poly basis, which is my basis of measurements. However, there are ways potentially around that that we can discuss later. Um, but nonetheless, so we'll talk, we'll start off with something more simple, something more effective uh, to do. And what we'll do is we'll start off with just a very simplistic, non-degenerate um, projector Hamiltonian, okay? And then we will evolve this Hamiltonian in the Heisenberg picture which gives us an isospectral transformation, which basically constrains the uh, eigenvectors such that the eigenvector of the initial Hamiltonian is obviously zero to the N. Okay, the eigenvector of the Hamiltonian down here is just gonna be zero to the N times U, and the eigenenergy of these things is just gonna be the one norm of the bit string. Okay, where the bit string here, of course, would be the one norm of that, so it would correspond to zero. Now, how do we apply gates? What is the cost when we apply gates? Um, the cost of applying gates, well, unfortunately, there's some bad news in this model. If I apply a general gate, the number of terms will blow up exponentially, but there's a bright side. If I apply a Clifford gate, the algebraic locality of the Hamiltonian will change. In other words, it can become more or less local. In other words, you can go from having a two-body term to a 10-body term, for example, okay? However, the number of terms, which is called the cardinality in this language, um, the cardinality does not change. And so that's kind of a nice feature. In other words, um, I can essentially, in some sense, Clifford Gates, I can mimic Clifford Gates for free. It's kind of a free lunch. And so that's very, very nice. And then the model becomes effective to demonstrate as long as I have some bounded number of non-Clifford Gates. And so what do we do next? Well, as I said, 
in order to apply um, in order to apply a non Clifford gate, I will end up with exponential overheads. Okay, so what can I do to get a universal model that doesn't have this feature? Well, um, there's some advantages here as well. I think it's more of a theoretical construction. I would say that the telescoping construction is maybe more practical um, for the short term, even though it won't give us anything uh, incredible because of the fact that we uh, have exponential overhead typically for non-Clifford gates. There are some ways around that, by the way. And so in general, we can actually add logarithmically many slack bits in the size of the quantum circuit, which in the adiabatic universality proofs, this was linear in L. Here it's logarithmic, so that's kind of nice, but it comes with excessive measurement overhead. And we will be able to prepare this uh, state efficiently. And to do that, um, you know, I, I went through this. It's actually a paper that I, that I wrote. So now we have PRA letters. I don't know why there's always a new journal, but now there's letters. And so this was a PRA letter. And the thing I found about PRA letters, if you send something to PRA letters and it gets in, you just think, hey, I should have sent that to PRL. I don't know. So whatever. And in any case, the construction of that paper goes through and it shows basically how to construct this penalty function so that the output of this penalty function will be the output of the circuit that you want to simulate. And there's a caveat. You should say already, you should say, hey, look, how can you tell me that a model of, because I'm, I'm going to tell you that this model is universal, actually. It's a universal model. And the point being this, it's universal based on the fact that the circuit itself defines the control sequence that causes the objective function to accept. It does not say that a short depth variational ansatz can mimic the output of any quantum circuit. It does not say that at all. What it says is that viewed as a model, viewed as, viewed as a model, this model, okay, so it looks like there is a question here. So it looks like I can, uh, I don't know what's going on, but it doesn't kind of let me do it. But I'll stop sharing my screen in a second, then I'll get to, the, I'll get to that because we have another five minutes until the end. And so viewed as a model, and I don't know why there's this green line, if you can see that. It doesn't show up on my, on my tablet, but it shows up on my main screen. And so viewed as a model of computation, uh, this model is universal, and that is the, the idea that you're going to mimic the effect of Hamiltonian through measurements, and you're going to uh, calculate an objective function and try, to, and try to minimize that. So what are the kind of discoveries that we've made in these variational algorithms? to kind of conclude the talk. So this is a good area actually um, that kind of merges, I'd say computer science and sort of condensed matter. So we want to, we, we really wanted to discover why these things do not work. And along the pathway, we accidentally made some discoveries. Well, we just discovered what we discovered. We have some results that I would say a little bit more negative and some results are quite positive in some sense. And so let me, let me just go through and kind of explain these. So quantum approximate optimization, you're given this sequence here and you're trying to find, you're trying to drive the system into the target state T, right? And what we found is that the parameters, if you, if you train this for one number of qubits W, we train this system, what we find is when we increase W, the parameters are nearly the same. And you can see this in the next thing, the step size gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And we call this a, it's a type of parameter concentration. There's other concentrations that exist. Uh, this was also published in Physical Review A letters. Um, the next finding is, this is a um, kind of a, I would say maybe not so unexpected. And this effect, which is called reachability deficit, this is an underparameterization, which is induced by problem density. So a problem density is the ratio of the number of variables Sorry, a ratio of the number of constraints to the number of variables. And it turns out that that ratio strongly depends on the depth of the circuit that you need to solve it, solve that instance. And it also turns out that most of the results in literature, all the results in literature, especially experimentally, and many of the results claiming and praising QAOA are either in the very low density uh, regime or they're in something that is the, a, a problem regime where there's so much symmetry in your problem that it also becomes easy. And you can kind of see, we get a kind of a logistic effect. 
there's a there's something there's some something reminiscent of a phase transition happening over here, and these you know and you sort of see logistic logistic effect, and the clause density is basically the the limiting feature. So it kind of it kind of goes up, and we did this for uh, max two sat and max three sat. And then finally, we have the idea of a abrupt transition. So some kind of la avalanche effect. We say, you know, given, uh, I, I just want to compile a unitary gate. So I want to create a, I want to use my ANSATs to create, for example, a Toffoli gate. What happens is it's kind of unusual. We did, you know, all of these calculations we're showing you right now, we did some analytics and some numerics. And so this one here, we did analytics at a couple layers. Um, one layer in particular was uh, quite clean, um, or at least possible. And what we show is that you, you can't train at all until you get a certain number of layers. Then it will train very, very fast. And so we have another minute, and then we'll go to the questions part. And interestingly enough, okay, there's one final effect, which is a saturation. So now we're going to train one layer at a time which is a common layer strategy. And what'll happen is these things will saturate. You'll end up with a situation where the next layer that you append, you can't get any closer to your target. But if you add noise, it'll actually take you out and you'll be able to get closer again, okay? And this is just a uh, some dephasing noise, coherent dephasing noise. And so I thank you for your attention. I will stop sharing my screen now. And then I think I can now see the chat. Okay, so let me let me see the questions. A very long question. Good question from Sarang Brosale. Okay, so please correct me um, on that name. So can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah, we do. Yes. Okay. Can we implement a density functional theoretic approach to minimize the energy and map this all in a form of a circuit? Does variational quantum algorithm take care of the errors involved in the minimization of the energy? What are the parameters for deciding a good VQE? So lots of questions, for sure good questions. Um, let, me, let me say this, it's a, it's a hot area of research. I think that um, these are just like research questions. So I don't know the answer to these questions off the top of my head, which is good, right? Um, in some sense, because the, you know, the, the topic is I would say fairly, fairly new. So what we do know is the following. So what I know, what I personally know is the following. If you give me a quantum circuit, I can construct a penalty function that I can minimize, and it'll give me the output of that circuit. In addition, we know those four effects that we showed, and maybe a few other effects. And there's another thing called barren plateaus, which show that you end up with very uh, vanishing gradients in some cases. We have parameters on all of these things. Uh, sorry, we have we have papers on all of these things in my lab that we work on. So. Um, the other stuff, you know, I would say that these are interesting questions and, you know, there's like a qualitative versus quantitative questions. And so these are some qualitative questions that might even have quantitative answers. Are there any other questions? If there are non, yeah, chat box, there is something, yes. Well, I mean, uh, you know. Okay, so let me let me tell you the following then. So I do believe that there's probably some people that are in the audience that are interested in this. It's maybe a little bit of a, more of a technical talk. I don't know. Um, yeah, you have time, you have time, yes. And so- There let is me, one more in chat box. Oh, could you please comment on layer-wise training in QAOA? Yes, let me comment on that because that's a let's let's go back and let's let's look at this real quick here. Can you see me sharing this? Is it working? Okay, it should be. Okay, so first of all, I'm always available. You can always ask me questions. I'm pretty friendly with this stuff. It's it's part of the research process to communicate and discuss. So what is layer-wise training, right? What is layer-wise training? So layer-wise training exists all over the literature. It's called the layer-wise trainability conjecture. I named it a conjecture because it's completely unproven. And if you notice over here, we completely crush it. 
we say, look, what, what we actually wanted to study here was you want to say, look, if you train with like, let's say two layers at a time, will that always work? Of course it shouldn't always work, right? It should fail. But what we had is we had these objective functions, which is the, the Toffoli gate. And you notice the Toffoli gate, the thermodynamic limit becomes indistinguishable from the identity. So it has this, it's exponentially close to this, this identity. So it's a hard gate to realize. If you don't factor it, you could factor it into blocks and you could realize the blocks, but trying to realize the whole gate, what you end up with is you end up with, okay, um, a scenario where, you know, it, it doesn't train at all. It doesn't train at all. And then it just sort of, or, or it stays at a constant amount of training and then it, then it, it's able to train. And so this is the first kind of result where it says, look, training in layers and even in blocks has limitations. And what it says is you can't decompose your problem. If you can't decompose your problem, then you're going to have uh, difficulty training, which is as expected. Now here, what we do is we train one layer at a time in quantum approximate optimization. Okay. And what happens is this one layer at a time approach starts to saturate. And interestingly enough, that next layer that comes on, which is very interesting, we don't have analytics for this, that next layer that comes on, only the trivial assignments of those angles allow, uh, keep you at the same level. Every other assignment of those will actually move you away from the target. We don't have analytics for that, okay? And these saturations, Start, for some reason, we don't have analytics for this either. We do have a lot of analytics in this paper, though, but just not for this. For some reason, when, when the number of layers reaches the number of qubits, this is where the saturations appear to happen. We don't know why that is. And in other words, we're training one layer at a time. We're optimizing at each step. It saturates. Then we throw in some coherent noise, and it'll train again. So we recover robustness to layer-wise training. So... It's a, you know, it's a toy model, right? Like you're not going to train one layer at a time, I suppose, but it gives you kind of the idea that, okay, what if, what if you did train with just some small number of layers at a time? Because the optimization step is a really a limiting feature. So I think, you know, I think that probably, um, I think partially answered that question. Do you feel that that answered the question? Perhaps. Okay, so I put my slides um, here, and so people can look into those slides and they can, uh, you know, take them for what they are. You're welcome to distribute them. These are completely free and open slides. And are there other are there other questions about this? Yeah, uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So first of all, thanks for the great talk. So. My question is in ideally quantum computation, this the complexity of the algorithm is decided by the minimum gap. So in VQA, do we have some something similar? Like can we calculate this complexity or is it more like heuristic algorithm? Okay. So um you know, I don't I would say this, I can give you a bunch of problems with fixed gap that vary in complexity. Right. So I wouldn't say that, I mean, if you have a vanishing, if you have some small gap, and, and so an adiabatic is different. An adiabatic, if you have a small gap, right, in this problem, then, you know, you, you would say, okay, it's going to be harder to anneal into the ground state. But there are many, there, you know, the, the thing is this, our, our driver Hamiltonian, there's no such thing as a driver Hamiltonian. We just prepare a state, and then we calculate the expected value. Um, of the Hamiltonian relative to the state we prepared. And we can construct a whole family of, let's say, constant gap Hamiltonians that have uh, various different problem instances in them. And so I would say that uh, your statement is correct as it would be for um, adiabatic quantum computation. It doesn't appear to have that type of validity in this uh, variational approach. So, but can we, you know, can we comment something like on uh, using some lab Robinson bound? Can we say, okay, this is the lower bound on the circuit depth to prepare some circuits or to find the ground states? Can we comment on that? Okay, so 
This is a very wonderful question, right? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I did on that was I said, okay, you have the, uh, you know, the simple, the simple bipartite entanglement argument. You say, look, if I want to be able to generate bipartite entanglement, what's the minimum depth circuit to possibly maximize bipartite entanglement? Then if you go in and you look at the um, Barron Plateau research, yeah, they use they use these light cones, which is similar to how the Lee Robinson bound works, and they determine properties of when the gradients will vanish or not. Now, if you take a Hamiltonian, you look at its dynamics and try to get the circuit out. Okay, we can we know something about one D physics from the matrix product state community, and we can probably say something about the depth that it would take to, in principle, prepare such a state because of the fact that we have the following theorem for matrix product states, which says that if my system is outside of a critical regime in one dimension, then a matrix product state with some, uh, some uh, controllable um, correlation, uh, controllable uh, chi, like the uh, bond dimension, exists, right? And so corrections to that can be given by Mara, for example. And so we, in 1D, we could probably say something about the relationship between the penalty function and the actual circuit, just by building on matrix product state theory. But in 2D, no, I don't think that we know that, know very much about that. It's a super interesting question. I'd be really happy to talk about that with you. It's, it's similar to the kind of questions we're asking as well. So I don't know the answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'd love to talk about it in more detail. So, uh, whoa, we have another question here. How does the performance of QAOA and VQE compare to Grover's algorithm? Any comment? Mm, that's a good question. So Grover's algorithm actually corresponds to the um, to a two what's called a two-level QAOA. So Grover is the version of QAOA where you have a projector onto the X. Uh, onto these X operators, and then a projector onto your solution space. And in our first paper, when we studied this, we said, oh, you know, let's use, let's use this. Let's use this exact solution. Let's study it. And asymptotically, Grover is optimal for N equals four qubits. I think we got something like a 7% gain. It had this little fluctuation, and then it sort of tapered off. And so asymptotically, they will kind of behave the same. And remember with Grover, there's only one unique search item. So your QAOA solution is uniform. Those angles that I'm gonna pick are uniform. Now the trouble goes into the following. Let's say that instead of having Grover, as my, which has a, you know, a single, this uh, single projector, let's say that instead I have this, uh, you know, a spin ice problem, okay? Um, which is some kind of Ising model on some kind of hexagonal lattice, for example. Okay, so this will have, you know, for instance, many different energy levels. It won't just be some projector. And these, these problems are very hard to tell the complexity of, and it's outside of what the, what the Grover problem is able to do, because the Grover problem searching for, for uh, it's, it's equivalent to just having a Hamiltonian, which is a projector with two energy levels and a trivial uh, bit string for the ground state. And this is, uh, this is something different. And so um, the performance of QAOA compared to Grover's algorithm, I would say that it will subsume Grover's algorithm in the two by two case, or, or the case where it's uh, projectors. And then going further, um, it would be a closer comparison perhaps, uh, as one of the other people mentioned, to the adiabatic algorithm. However, uh, it's somewhat different. So yeah, it's, it's not an easy question to, to answer fully, but that's the answer so that I have anyway. Uh, VQE. Um, VQE is about minimization, finding the lowest eigenvalue of a, you know, of some, let, let's say, electronic structure Hamiltonian. And so that one doesn't relate to Grover's algorithm very easily either. So. Okay, it looks like no more questions. Uh, thanks, Professor Baimonte. Oh, there is one more. Yeah, oh, thank you. Okay. All right. How does the performance of QAOA and VQE, no, wait. Oh, thank you for the clarity. Really enjoyed the talk. Yeah, I'm, I, I wish I had better answers, to be honest, but I think it's, 
I think it's kind of a change in quantum computing where the circuit model is being viewed differently and this outer loop optimization is very hard to do analysis on. And also it's a time period where the computer scientist um, isn't as welcome in this area as it was in the past because we now really need to understand this condensed matter of concepts. But I always tell people, I was like, you know, um, it's an equal mixture of computer science, condensed matter physics and mathematics to make everyone hate what you're doing. And so, <laughs> but let's, you know, I, I, let's, let's see what the, uh, let's see what the younger generation does with this stuff because, you know, I'm not going to stop working, but I think we, I think we need more people to take a look at it. So we'll see. Okay. So thank you so much. Yeah. Really enjoyed it. An absolute pleasure. See you next time. Sure.